I guess the first thing to talk about is the, the giant Canada goose. Um, it's, a, it's a native species to Illinois. Uh, everybody here is most likely familiar with it. That's why you're here. Uh, and they can live for a long time. Uh, in the wild, they can live anywhere between 10 and 24 years. So it's a long-lived bird species. Um, and actually, in the 1940s and 50s, they were hunted to near extinction. And the, the giant Canada goose, um, was thought to be extinct. Um, there was a, a small population found in, in Minnesota, um, and since then, it has made a dramatic comeback throughout um, the Midwest, throughout the United States, and it uh, is a, a true wildlife success story, actually, um, the fact that they were able to do as well as they, they have. Um, and a lot of it has to do with the the habitat that that uh, we all of us here have provided for them, um, especially in our urban urban areas, um, Canada geese need water. They need some sort of grass type forage. Uh, they need access to other food potentially. Um, if they can't find enough forage um, within the grass setting that they're in, so agricultural fields, um, people growing corn, soybeans, uh, wheat, that sort of thing. Uh, they really like mowed lawns though for a couple reasons. One is they digest grass really well. It's easy for them to digest. And two, a lot of times our mowed grass is big open areas and that makes it really easy for them to look for predators. So they can be alert, they have a, an aspect of safety um, while, they, while they get their meal. And uh, so Geese graze on, on these, these grass lawns, they loaf in the ponds, they, if they need more food they can fly out to agricultural fields. Uh, geese, a lot of people will say geese mate for life and it's true that geese don't often um, split up from a mate uh, if there's no need to. They will remate re if, uh, if one of their mates uh, doesn't survive a migration or, or for whatever reason isn't there, they will remate. Um, and they usually don't breed until their fourth year. So there's a period of time where they're, um, they look like adults, they act like adults, but they're not necessarily breeding. Um, and those birds that do uh, breed and, and nest and have a successful uh, group of goslings, those goslings usually return to wherever they learn to fly. And so as we'll talk about a little later, that can sometimes compound our problems when um, you have goslings that come back every year to, to a specific place. Another important thing to note is that not all Canada geese are the same. There are many different subspecies of Canada geese. Uh, at one point, I think the number was up to 27, but luckily they've shrunk that down a bit for us. Uh, the geese that we're talking about here that are, are generally the nuisance geese um, are the giant Canada geese. So sometimes we call them resident Canada geese. Um, officially they're giant Canada geese. And the, um, the, one, the other type of goose that we frequently see here in Illinois is the interior Canada goose. And for the most part, just looking at them, you're not going to be able to tell the difference. Um, the interior Canada goose uh, breeds and nests up in Canada, further north, and they migrate through. So in the winter time, when all of a sudden you see a bunch more geese come in, those are interiors. When you have geese nesting on your property or you see them in summer, those are the giant Canada goose. And typically, those are the ones that we have nuisance issues with. Again, those giant Canada geese are the ones that we typically find in Champaign. And as those adults have goslings, those goslings stick around. Sometimes those, those birds actually never migrate at all. Here's just a couple graphs showing the, uh, the population for Illinois and the Mississippi Flyway. Um, the Mississippi Flyway is kind of all of the states that border up and down the Mississippi River. And those are kind of the, the migration corridor for, for the Canada geese that we would see passing through Illinois. Um, as you can see, the, the giant population in the state somewhat fluctuates year to year. Um, it's statewide pretty stable, but in a lot of local areas we are seeing increases in, in Canada geese. Um, so though the, the population is, is doing just fine and, and might 
you know, at a, at a statewide level look to be the same. Uh, in a lot of these local areas, like in Champaign or like up in Chicago, uh, we are seeing increases in those numbers. And as we see the increases the, in population, the nuisance or conflict also increases. So we're see, seeing a lot more, or having a lot more conflict between geese and humans in, in some of these areas. And again, I mentioned it at the beginning, part of that is our own fault because we've created these perfect um, habitats for geese and, and then we expect them not to use it. <laughs> and so uh, we provide them with uh, areas with food, water, safety. Um, and so, you know, it, those types of habitats are something to consider when, when we're talking about managing geese. But the conflicts that we are experiencing can be serious. I mean, there's the, the conflict of an accumulation of fecal matter that, that can occur, but also there are bird strikes with airplanes. Uh, the Hudson, the miracle on the Hudson is an example of geese that hit a plane or plane hit geese and you know there was a, a big concern. So throughout, throughout the state looking at airports, that's something that we're considering as well. And USDA is a, a big player in, in keeping our airports safe. Um, but again, so these conflicts can be both, you know, either small scale or, or large scale. And this graph just shows the, um, the population of Canada geese throughout the, throughout the, the continent, so North America. Again, um, it's, it was increasing, it's, it's somewhat stabilizing, right at about four and a half million geese in North America. Um, and one of the problems that we're seeing in Illinois is a limited migration. Fewer geese are migrating, um, or it seems like fewer geese are migrating every year. And there's a whole list of reasons why that might be that I'm not really gonna get into tonight, but bottom line is we're seeing more geese on the landscape, especially in some of our local areas, and they don't seem to be leaving. And I'm sure a lot of people have experienced that in this room. So here's just a little look at Champaign, Urbana, and Savoy. And what's outlined there are some of these these uh, small bodies of water, um, you might not show up very well on there, but there's a bunch of small bodies of water surrounded by parks, golf courses, homeowners associations, areas that have grass and uh, open areas, places for safety. So there's a lot of potential goose habitat in the area. And then you'll notice what surrounds all of Champaign, Urbana, and Savoy is crop fields. And so there's a food source there as well um, for geese that are either migrating in or more, more uh, appropriately for tonight, all of our geese that are here year round. So this, this area is kind of the perfect mix for geese. Um, they, they've got the habitat they like. And so that's why we're seeing an increase in conflict here. Getting to a more legal standpoint, um, pe most people are vaguely aware that geese are protected. They'll say, you know, geese are a protected species. Um, specifically, they're protected at two levels. There's the federal level, which is the Migratory Bird Treaty Act, uh, which is administered by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Uh, that, that treaty act was put into place in the early 1900s to protect all migratory birds, Canada geese included, and it was to protect from over-harvesting. There was a, a large trade for feathers and meat and, and there were few regulations and so we were seeing birds disappear from the landscape and so the, the Migratory Bird Treaty Act was put in place to try to protect those. Um, and Illinois Illinois has its own laws, the Illinois Compiled Statutes or, or our Wildlife Code that very much mimic the, um, the Migratory Bird Treaty Act. So they're very similar, they have a lot of the same protections and one of the big things, again, people, like I said, vaguely know that Canada geese are protected. Um, so one of the big questions is what can we do without a permit? You know, where, where is there some leeway? And luckily, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service does offer some leeway. Um, they recognize the problem, some of the issues that, that people are having with Canada geese. And so they've reached out to the states and given the states a little bit more flexibility in what management can be applied and, and what, what can be done. 
So Scott and, and Craig are gonna go into this a little bit more, um, but without a permit, you're allowed to do things like harass geese that are causing a nuisance on your property. You can chase them, you can yell at them. Um, the big things with harassing geese are you can't touch them, or if they're nesting, you can't mess around with their nest, that sort of thing. But there's a lot of other things too, you know, managing habitat, that sort of thing. The USDA guys are gonna get into, but you don't need any sort of permit for that. Whereas doing things like nest and egg management and control, that is where permits come into play. Once you actually start wanting to um, touch, not necessarily birds, but the nests and eggs, once you start messing around with that, we need to track that. We don't want, again, we don't want to lose our species. We want to make sure we have a good um, handle on who's doing what and where, and so that sort of activity does need to be permitted. So some of the conflicts that, again, I'm sure a lot of people in the room are aware of, um, the nuisance conflicts that we're dealing with are um, where geese are overabundant. And that word overabundant is tricky because it can mean something different to different people. Um, you know, there's, there's not a lot of places in Illinois um, outside of some of our urban areas where you might consider geese overabundant. And overabundance, like I said, means something different to each person. And so it's in these public areas or, or areas that are meant for multiple use where humans are trying to enjoy them. People are trying to walk dogs. Um, you know, there are other wildlife species. And for whatever reason, there's a conflict with geese there, whether it's um, the accumulation of fecal matter, aggressive geese, that's where we're seeing our conflict. And, and most likely that's where people are saying geese are overabundant. And with overabundance too, um, I think it's important to recognize that even with a lot of the management techniques that Scott and Craig are gonna go over here in a minute, um, it's not really realistic to assume that you'll never have Canada geese on your properties. Again, I showed you the map. We've got a very good mix of, of habitat for Canada geese in Champaign-Urbana. Uh, so realistically, there's, there will always probably be some use. The key for folks to, to clue in on is trying to get those levels to a, a point where uh, you're comfortable with it, you're okay with how many geese, you can tolerate some of the conflict. Where it gets out of control is when people really start panicking and are having issues. So here's just a couple examples of, of potential conflicts. Here you've got a, a beach that uh, people might not want to use with all of the geese out there. And then on the second, on the second picture, you know, we've highlighted all of the, the goose fecal matter out on that beach. And so, you know, excessive fecal matter, I, I get questions about geese all the time. This is a big one that I get is that, you know, they're, they're pooping all over our lawn, all over our walkway, that sort of thing. And it's to the point where nobody can enjoy it. We can't go out, we can't walk with our kids in the grass, that sort of thing. Another big one is aggressive geese during the nesting season. They say, um, I get calls again from people that have geese nesting on their property and they, they thought they really liked it and then all of a sudden they started being attacked by the geese. And so that's another common conflict that we see. Um, and so I'll kind of wrap up by saying, what do we do about that? What do we do when we have these conflicts? And I'm gonna turn it over to Scott here. It's gonna take a minute to transfer all of my microphones, um, but I'm gonna turn it over to Scott to kind of tell us what do, where do we go from here? We know about the geese, we know why they're there, we know why we have the problem, but what do we do about it? So give me just a minute. The, the first slide we had up there showed uh, Ben's name and then our agency and DNR and our program, USD, USDA, which is US Department of Agriculture and Wildlife Services, work really closely to help mitigate conflicts with wildlife. Tonight it's geese, but we work on a lot of fronts together. Um, the Wildlife Services program, our program's mission, is to provide federal leadership in mitigating conflicts with wildlife. So that's why someone from the USDA is here tonight. That's all that we do. I'm Scott Beckerman. I'm a wildlife biologist and state director with Wildlife Services. And Craig will be up here in a minute, and he's a wildlife biologist, Craig Bloomquist, and a district supervisor. He supervises our work in the southern two-thirds of the state. 
The other employee we had was Brad Wilson. He's a wildlife biologist, staff biologist for us, and unfortunately at the last minute he was unable to come. So we uh, paper, scissors, rocked, and Craig got to, gets to do Brad's talk a little bit later. So after this next segment, we're gonna focus on, you know, what options are out there that work and which ones do and, and don't really provide good results in trying to mitigate a, a conflict with geese. We'll spend a few minutes, maybe five to 10 minutes, on three methods that we really thought that you should learn more about if you don't know about them. One is um, the egg oiling process, permitting, and, and how you actually do that on your own property legally. Uh, another is uh, the overhead wire barrier systems, how effective, how to put them up, and how well they might work on a body of water that you have. And then the other is uh, chemical repellents that are used as foraging deterrents. So that kind of lays out where we're going to go from here over the next 40 minutes or so. Um, let's see. I want to make sure I covered everything I wanted to cover. All right. So what can we do about all the problems that Ben kind of described us, which most of you probably are not here because you want to promote and have more geese on your land. You're probably here because there might be a conflict or you want to learn about how you can help others solve conflicts with geese. The first thing we look for is really long-term strategies that are going to provide some effectiveness. And probably one of the best ways to do that is modifying human behavior in regards to how we as people attract birds in large numbers to small sites through feeding, artificial feeding. And so we really work to try to educate people that while you think feeding geese is good, it's really not. You're congregating them in large numbers, the feces begin to build up, and you all know that if you have a goose problem in feeders. Now while it's not illegal to feed, we really work to try to promote this aspect of peer pressure. Don't feed because it's not helping our problem. The other side of that is it's, it's not healthy for the birds. And you can see in the, the bottom right picture here, in very rare cases when the nutrient deficiencies are great, very high caloric intake, that last joint of the wing will become entangled with the feathers and causes that, the tip, and that's called angel wing, and it's, it's not repairable. That bird will have that for life and it can never fly again. Fortunately, it's not common, but it can happen. Just another reason why we really discourage people from feeding waterfowl. So that's really the first step in the process. And then where do we go from there? So then next for long term we really look towards habitat solutions. Work with a lot of people who have, let's say, sites like this top left one. Anybody here have a body of water that has an island on it? One, couple, few. So at your place you have geese. No geese? Okay, well that's good. Well, I gotta hook up with you afterwards. You, where do your geese nest? Do they nest on that island? Partially on the island and partially over the side of the pond. Okay, so the island and the, and the edge, the margins of the pond, which is usually where they nest. You put an island out there, they congregate on the island in most cases because there's less predators and they're seeking ways to produce young with less predation. Those islands are a real challenge to deal with when you have larger numbers of geese and more nests and more offspring out there. Now there are some ways to discourage birds from using them, but they become a challenge in the long term. So we work with designers now to make sure that they're not designing new bodies of water with islands and try to get them to not put peninsulas in those as well because those function as an island. So that's a challenge. But we get down to, let's say, the bottom left here. Riprap, um, steep banks. That steep bank here is much less attractive to geese than these very shallow uh, gradients where they can just walk out. Now the riprap, the big rock, the chunk rock alone won't deter geese. You can put it in and they're still gonna go over it and use it. It can be part of a strategy to help solve a problem, but it's not a tool that you can spend tens of thousands of dollars on and think it's going to solve your problem. You've got to do more. You have to do many strategies to try to solve an overabundant goose problem. Some communities take drastic measures like this top right one and they'll put a fence around their basin. And that 
stops walking between the water and the grass, and that really does help. But depending on the size of the basin, if it's a bigger basin, they'll just fly over that fence. If it's a very small basin, they, they usually won't fly over it. It's not worth trying to land on a small body of water. But that perimeter fencing is effective, and we'll cover that a little later in the grids, too. And one of the greatest complaints we hear is, whoops, the fecal buildup that you see on sidewalks and paths. And usually now we have a lot of walking paths and they're around the body of water and people enjoy using them, but that's where the geese like to be too because they can see predators better. And so we see some sites that will put a form of fencing along the edges of their paths and that can work really well, but it can also function as a funnel to where if the geese come off the water and you have an intersection and the geese get up in there and you can't close it off completely, they'll get on that walkway and then they use that walkway to get to the next basin. So it's not a solution in every case, but those barrier fences along walkways can help in some places. Another vegetation, natural type of management that provides long-term benefits are these native vegetation buffers along the edge of the water, like here on the left. Tall, dense native vegetation provides long-term uh, relief in the geese transitioning from the water to the land. They don't like to nest in that as much because they can't see predators. So it really is an effective approach to helping reduce goose use of a basin. The problem is, is you have to have that barrier fairly wide. In my experience, if you don't have that barrier of tall vegetation, at least 75 feet, you're wasting your time. These places that mow down close to it have created a nice barrier to help improve water quality, filter out some of the sediments and, and other chemicals flowing into the basin. The problem is, is the geese will be like cattle and they'll tromp a path right through that tall, thick vegetation to get where they want to be in the nice mowed, fertilized grass that we provide them. So again, good tool, but you have to do it right. You have to have a large space to use this tall native grass barrier. Let's see, um, the top right, fountains, uh, aerators. Anybody have a fountain or an aerator in their basin? Quite a few, and usually people put them in for, to increase oxygen content in the water for fish. Maybe it's aesthetics. Um, usually, sometimes it's both. They don't deter geese, number one, and you probably know that. But the, in the winter, they become an even greater problem for us. If you leave them function in the winter, the few winters that we have that are cold enough anymore, where the body of water would completely freeze, the aerator or the fountain will keep that water open in the middle. And what happens is the geese are gonna congregate around what little open water they have left. And so, uh, let's say a homeowner's association will see you have an aerator. They may have 50 or 60 geese. And when they're the last pond around with open water, they'll have 500 geese. We just recommend turn those things off in the fall if you can. Let that pond freeze naturally and force those birds, when it gets really cold and ice is everywhere, force them to move south. Southern Illinois, you know, Kentucky, Tennessee, wherever they need to go to find open water help reduce our problem and not increase the problem at your place. Other options, habitat management. Well, now we're gonna to move to exclusion. We don't see it a lot, but the places that can employ these overhead wire barrier systems, it's extremely effective at reducing goose use. And so here, it's kinda of hard to see right now these wire barriers but I'll highlight where they are. And they're not complex. They work really well because they deter geese from landing in the water and they don't like to swim on the water with these wires in there. We space them at about 20 feet. They're just above the water surface, 12 to no more than 18 inches above the water. But they're not a solution for every body of water. I mean, you have water bodies. Why might you not want an overhead wire barrier system on your body of water? Kayaks, what else? Fishing. Fishing, anybody wants to fish in that pond? 
It's a deterrent to fishermen and fisher ladies, I guess. I'm not sure what the proper term for that is, I'm sorry. Um, and we've seen what we think are fishers in a night go through and cut every one of those wires along the edge they like to fish. And I can understand their frustration. Um, so it's not the solution everywhere, but the places that we can erect those, they are extremely effective at discouraging goose use of the site. Now we do run into a few problems. Sometimes when there's a large number of birds using the site, and they'll still want to continue to use that basin, we'll have to put in a perimeter fence about three foot tall around the edge, kind of like I showed in the other slide, and incorporate that with the overhead barrier system, and that is almost 100% effective. Now, it stops some other things, some other human uses, maybe other wildlife use of the site. So maybe that's not an option that you want to employ, but they do work well, and I'll go into it a little bit uh, more in-depth demo on this overhead wire barrier system because we really want people to know about how effective and how economical it is. So that'll be one of our three demos in a bit. So those are most of the effective things we can do for long-term management. They might not work on every site, but they are available and they should be at least considered. Now we want to look to some shorter term tools or, or tools that work in the short term and we really have to continue to apply them. Dispersal and harassment methods. And some of these are very effective and some the birds habituate to. So on the left you'll see, and it's not on a lake, it's just one of the few sites we have at night where we've captured our use of lasers to disperse birds. A, a pretty good photo of a green laser for birds. Um, they work pretty well for geese. Um, in the morning and in the evening in the low light times of the day, especially when they're novel, the geese will get up and fly off the pond. But if you use a laser every day, morning and evening, after a period of time they begin to habituate to it because it didn't cause pain, there was no reinforcement, and it begins to be a little bit less effective at dispersing them from the site. So again, we need to integrate other tools in. Remember, if you're going to do one thing all the time, they're probably going to get used to it pretty quick. Uh, anybody here ever use lasers? A few. Um, what colored lasers do you use? How about green? Green? I don't know what color. Do you use green or red, or do you remember? Green. green. So in our experience, green lasers are much more visible to geese than red, and they're widely available now. And if you want to stay afterwards, we have some lasers up here, different ones that we can let people see. Probably not pass them around because of the COVID thing, but you can come look at them and we can demonstrate them if you want to stay afterwards. Um, but a very effective tool um, when used properly and supported with other tools. Um, canines, top right here. It's probably one of the most effective tools um, at dispersing geese. But again, as a dispersal tool, you really have to understand that it takes consistent use of, the, of the, this tool. You're not going to scare off the geese with a dog and walk away and think you're done. It may take a couple visits a day, three, four, five, seven days a week for an extended period of time. So it can work. You have to be very dedicated to it. And there are companies that do this for hire. Um, I can't say it's cheap or expensive. It's all relative. Um, but they are very effective for the sites that choose to expend the funds to, to try to employ that tool and then reinforce it with other tools, maybe like lasers or some of the other things. There are tools that we know just don't work well in urban areas. They're special fireworks. We use them extensively in rural areas and on airports. They're fired from starters, pistols. You're not going to shoot that off in a homeowners association. Even though you could get permission to do so from the fire department, it would be legal and the city would allow you to do it. You just can't do that anymore because you have first responders that work all night and they try to sleep in the day and then we're out there trying to shag the geese out and people get upset. Um, these propane exploders, they're hooked to a propane tank just like the one on your grill. We adjust the time, they have an explosion that sounds about twice as loud as a shotgun and, and then we can set it off every two minutes to maybe 40 minutes depending on how we adjust the needle valve. They work pretty good in rural areas and we can move them around the pond or the wheat field. 
I'm not going to use this in town. That's not going to happen. You'll have more people hating you than you can know in just a matter of minutes. So even when we put them in rural areas now, there's a lot of people like me that live on the fringe of town and they don't want to listen to that. So we have a lot of tools and some of them work really great, but they just can't be applied in an urban setting if we have an urban goose conflict. Um, drones. Anybody in here have a child or a friend of a child or a niece or nephew that has a, a drone, an unmanned aircraft? Anybody? No, that's it's we, a few. I've seen them. You've seen them. Yeah, and, and they're out at the football games now. You go to the football game, that's how they film them. So I don't have a picture of it, and, but we do a lot of work with drones. But you have to understand that while drones may seem like a great idea to use to disperse geese, it is not legal. There is a federal law that was created decades ago that banned the use of any aircraft in harassing wildlife. And the concern is that if you allow people to use aircraft to harass wildlife, people may use aircraft to aid in the, the hunting and take of wild animals. And that did happen. And that's why they passed this act. So right now there's almost no legal use of drones to disperse wild animals. It's not something we want to condone for goose damage management. Swans. Who's got swans? A few people have sw swan decoys. Your swans solve a goose problem? No. I mean, they're, they're probably nice to look at, great to have, take some extra management. That's probably one of the most common things we're asked about is can we get swans and it's not illegal um, usually the swans in every case are going to be purchased or mute swans they're an invasive species we do have a problem in illinois with this species increasing in number because they breed produce young move to the natural areas and then compete with native wildlife but that's another issue in an overabundant goose situation swans the theory is will deter the geese. And if you have a mated pair of swans that are defending a nest, just like the geese defend a nest in the spring, they will in many cases defend an area around that nest to keep the geese away. But that's a mated pair of swans. Most people don't have a mated pair. They have a single swan or many times they'll have two of the same sex so that they don't breed. The breeders sell them that way because they don't want to have them increase in numbers and cause problems. So if you have a single swan or two males, let's say, they're not laying eggs. They're not defending a nest site. They're not going to keep geese away, even from an area that a mated pair might. And if you have a mated pair, they're only going to defend that area from geese around their nest while they have a nest. So we're talking 40 days with laying eggs and incubation a month month and a half so now you got ten and a half months of the year swans and no goose control and they don't keep them away from a whole pond anyway it's a very small area the other thing and I don't have anything against swans I'm just telling you how effective they are for geese the other challenge you have with mute swans is that they do more destruction to the aquatic vegetation than geese do as they forage so if you had a problem with vegetation being damaged, if you had aquatic vegetation, swans are going to exacerbate that. But the bigger problem is we get a number of calls a year about geese attacking people while they defend their nest. What else? Um, flashing lights. We, uh, we see these flashing lights and flashing lasers that companies sell them and they put them, you can put them in the water, they float, they're solar powered many times. And actually they do kind of keep the geese away from an area around the light and some of them might be 20, 30 yards. Um, generally it's only going to be at night because during the day they're not flashing, they have a photo cell in them. They go off during the day so they don't waste their battery. So they might work at night. If you have a very big body of water, you need a lot of them. And I suspect that if you had a body of water, you know, like this, and you had lights down this thing, 20, 30 lights on there, I suspect after a month or so, they probably habituate to them because the light just flashed. It never really hurt them and scared them like a predator might. So they can help on small sites, 
but they're not the solution to a problem in the long term. And then effigies up here. Here's a, a coyote, plastic coyote effigy. They sell coyote effigies, dead goose effigies. You know, you float it in the water, it looks like a dead goose. Um, alligator effigies, anybody seen those? You blow them up, buy plastic ones. I don't know that our geese around here would ever be afraid of an alligator because they don't know what that is. Alive. Pardon me? Alive. Yours is a live alligator. Well, that probably works better. Anything that's a real threat to a goose's life is great for a dispersal agent. <laughs> um, and they know it. The, uh, where was I going with this? Um, the dead goose decoy, well, <laughs> hunters put out decoys to attract geese. Now, it's not, it's not some goose laying over dead, but um, they sell plastic dead goose decoys. I, I don't recommend people invest in them. Very short-term effectiveness for dispersing birds. So invest in things that we think will provide you longer-term benefits. Now, I'll probably find someone in the crown that put up a, a coyote decoy and they think that thing is the best thing that ever happened and they've never had another goose in their yard and I say keep it, keep using it. But when we deal with hundreds of people in many, many locations, it generally they just don't pan out to be a successful part of an integrated management program. Let's see. Oh, and the other thing I wanted to just briefly mention about harassment in general, um, because we've been really interested in how effective is scaring birds from a body of water in an urban area. And we partnered with the DNR and the U of I, and they brought on an a outstanding PhD student in Chicago. And we work very closely with him to scare large numbers of geese off Chicago Park routinely throughout the day and he monitored them with satellite transmitters. Where'd they go? How long did they spend time there? How long did it take for the geese to come back? And he's getting ready to publish that. Um, he's in the process now of submitting it. And the bottom line was we were out there two to three times a day shagging those geese out and we did not alter their use of habitat. They came back all winter long they just, the sites are a draw. So sometimes harassment isn't going to be the thing that solves your problem. You might need to be looking at exclusion, habitat changes, or some other things. Or maybe more intensive harassment, maybe with canines four or five times a day. Something more invasive than two to three times a day. How are we doing on time? I, I don't even know what, I guess there's a clock there. So we're good. We're quarter after. Um, a few more things, um, non-lethal that work. Um, registered chemical repellents that are designed to be foraging repellents. They're not going to keep the geese away because um, they taste bad. Well, the taste is nothing because they smell bad or anything like that. These products are designed to be put on the grass so that when the geese forage on them, something happens, it doesn't taste right, they don't feel good, and they're gonna forage somewhere else. There's two main products out there that work. There's one that's methylanthranolate based, uh, which is in a derivative from Concord grapes. It's been around since the early 90s. We did some of the original tests with the company trying to get it registered with the EPA. That product has very variable results in our latitude because of the humidity and the ultraviolet light in the summer. Another product, and we're not condoning any, this is just one, anthraquinone is the active ingredient sprayed on grass. Um, we have used it extensively and it provides uh, a lot better repellency. Um, enough to the point where we wanted to cover it today in detail, so Craig's gonna do, I don't know, six, eight, 10 slides or something so that you really understand chemical repellents a little better so you know if they might work for you or not. So just hang on in 15 minutes and we'll cover repellents a little bit better. So where do we go next? You know, we've, we've went through human behavior modification, habitat management, exclusion, dispersal harassment tools, and if those things don't work, and it's because we have an overabundant goose population, we really now have to begin to look at do we begin to manage the number of birds? And what tools are out there to do that? Well, hunting is the one that has been used for 
centuries probably, probably will be much longer than that. In our state, we know that geese are protected by federal and state laws, but we also know that the DNR administers a early season goose hunt, September 1st through the 15th for 15 days. And it's designed to focus hunter harvest on these resident birds, these ones that are here in the summer and breeding. It is really effective at helping us manage our bird numbers in urban areas as long as we can get hunters where the birds are congregating. And so Ben touched on the effectiveness, let's say for Champaign, Urbana, Savoy, is in town we can't hunt. Hunters aren't going to hunt here. It's not safe or legal. But when they feed in the rural areas just outside of town, hunters then can harvest them. Unfortunately, what appears to be happening is we have good harvest, great hunters, but they're not harvesting enough birds to keep the population from continuing to slowly increase in Champaign, Urbana, and Savoy. So our numbers are continually going up. It's not a dramatic increase, but it's getting to the point where some people feel we have, they have too many geese in their urban sites. So there's the early hunting season, and then there's a regular hunting season that runs into the fall and the early winter. Now that season, hunters take both these resident birds, plus some of the interiors that Ben talked about. They're showing up from Canada beginning around late September in some years, maybe later, October, November. Large influxes of birds, and so the hunters take a mix of geese. They can't tell the difference. They all look the same. But biologically, we know what's going on. So hunting is an extremely important tool to help us manage numbers of geese. It's just as we get a large urban area, the birds spend less time out in the rural areas nearby where hunters actually have access to managing their numbers legally. So hunting may or may not be the solution in some areas. Um, so we have to really look at what else can we do if our numbers continue to increase. We look at trying to stem the increase in population through managing the fertility of the eggs, egg oiling. Ben issues free permits that authorize egg oiling. Craig drew the short straw. He's going to get to take Brad's talk and talk about egg oiling. We'll go in depth into how you do that. Him and Ben will cover the permitting and all. The bottom line is the process is designed so early in incubation, you would apply vegetable oil to the egg, stop the diffusion of oxygen in to stop the development of the embryo. Kind of like putting chicken eggs in the fridge. Stops development. Now, you have to understand that while we can prevent four to eight goslings from this pair of geese through this method this year, we're not going to reduce the size of the population for quite a while because those geese that reach breeding age live a long time. They can live 10 to 15 to 20 years. So if we have a pair and they're four and they're breeding and we stop their nest, we haven't reduced the population. We just stopped an increase of four or five more. And next year we oil their eggs and we stop their production. But those two are still here. We, this method takes a decade or more of successful implementation in a fairly large area to ever begin to see a decline in the population through attrition. These birds starting to die off as they get old. So it is a very important tool to help stem the increase, but don't expect to see a decline in the population in the short term from egg oiling. Um, another method of managing production, and I just want to hit on it because you may see it in the, uh, on the internet or in some of the literature. There's a chemical called nicarbazine. It's a registered uh, product registered for use in many states, not here. And it's sold under the trade name of Ovo Control G. It's kind of hard to see in the middle here. There's this treated bait. You have to feed the geese every day. They have to eat this product every day for a period of time before they start laying eggs and throughout the egg laying period. And it causes the egg to become infertile. And they're dropping eggs in their nest. They have no idea that the yolk inside is infertile. And then they sit on that thinking they're going to hatch a clutch, and somewhere near the end of it, it rots and breaks and the coons eat it or whatever happens. Similar outcome is when you oiled it with vegetable oil, no production from the young. 
the, the challenge we have is this method is prohibited in Illinois um, compiled statutes in the wildlife code because it's a chemical that you would be targeting to use on a game, protected game animal. And that's not legal in our state. But to be honest, I don't think it's a big deal because there's very few places in the US where this product has actually shown effective control of birds. It's just, it's a difficult thing to deal with. And any other birds that eat that, if you have sparrows, let's say protected morning doves, blue jays, if they start eating it, same effect infertile eggs and we don't want non-target birds taking this chemical and affecting their production. We already have enough problems with uh, songbirds and other bird nesting declining. So it's not legal, but it's probably not a big loss here, but I didn't want to not cover that. Um, another one, this is probably the second most common thing we get asked, well, can't you just take these birds and move them somewhere else. Everybody wants that. Relocation, it's called capture and relocation. But you have to understand, if you have an overabundant goose problem and conflicts with geese in your area, if those birds are picked up, moved somewhere else and released, many times they start to cause the same conflicts in the areas where you turn them loose. So what we end up seeing through time is we're moving your problem to be somebody else's problem. And somebody else isn't happy. And we really try to avoid that. Coupled with that, banding records show that the older breeding birds, these after hatch years, we round up all the young and all the big birds and we move them. Where the bird learns to fly is where it returns to breed in that general area in future years, like Ben said. So the young may breed where we turned them loose over here in Vermilion County, but those bigger birds, that were nesting there are gonna eventually probably fly back and nest there next year, chances are. So in the end, we really didn't help you much. All you ended up doing is not having the gosling production, which maybe you could have achieved through egg oiling. So relocation is not a method that's approved by the DNR because it's not effective at resolving conflicts in the long term in Illinois. And really, there's very few other options to manage an overabundant goose population. Overabundant is, is in the eye of the landowner, because that who has the authority to determine what is an acceptable number of birds, are we happy with our site? Really, the last tool we have to manage those birds is through a program called Charity Harvest. It's a program that the DNR can issue a special permit to that landowner where it will allow them, when other reasonable tools are not expected to provide a reduction in damage or conflicts, will allow them to work, in this case, with us to round those birds up in June and July when they're flightless. We capture them. We mainly transport them to a Department of Agriculture licensed processing plant where they're processed into ground goose, just like the same process at the same plants where our chicken and our turkeys come from. If anybody in here eats chicken and turkeys, they're all processed in accordance with federal and state laws and the, and the plants that do this do it the same way as our domestic poultry. I guess one of the better outcomes of this is that it is the meat products are required to be given to charitable organizations and then donated to needy individuals, underprivileged people. So that is one benefit, although the process may not be the most appealing, it really does allow people with an overabundant goose problem to reach their goal, lower numbers, whatever that might be, in a, in a very short period of time, one year, one summer, and then they can try to keep it down at that level with all these other tools. The other tools are much more effective when the number of birds are not significantly overabundant. And we see that time and time again. I guess I wanted to reiterate the need to use as many tools as you can. Don't just grab one tool and think that's gonna solve your problem. It won't work. Geese are too smart and they learn too quickly. Um, you can, if you have a problem with geese, Ben provides a tremendous amount of technical assistance. You can contact Ben. Um, Craig, Brad, and myself take a lot of calls. 
We provide free technical assistance. Um, a lot of times we'll go to a site. Now this was pre-COVID, we've kind of modified things during COVID, but we'd meet at a site free of charge, work to help that site manager, if it's an HOA or park district, district modify their plan to be more effective in managing geese, or maybe start a plan in how to manage conflicts with geese. Um, we'll provide free training and how to oil eggs at the site um, and help get your plan going. I wanted to make sure that we thank Ryan and Herbert and Extension for providing us the facility. It's hard to find a place now that you can get together as a group like this. So thank you again very much. I appreciate that. And I think we decided maybe we'd, instead of having questions now, we'd show these three quick PowerPoints. And then All right, overhead wire barrier systems. Um, so we've seen them used and we've helped municipal parks, corporate water basin owners, and, and residential HOAs put them up in the Midwest. And, and it is a, a tool, and you saw this slide, bef slide before, it is a tool that can work very well when it can be used. Uh, we talked about when it can't be used, when you have alternative uses of that basin that would be ranked as a higher priority than trying to use this tool as a way to mitigate conflicts with geese. Um, I mentioned before that perimeter fence. I have seen, I don't know, it may be 5% or 10% of the sites, it seems like, will put an overhead barrier wire system in and the geese continue to use it and then we modify that and they continue to use it and then we'll go ahead and put a perimeter fence around the edge Another cost, and, and that is quite costly, but that really is really kind of the nails in the coffin of, of high bird use of that site, if that's what their goal is. So that, that second component can be an important part of making it an effective tool. So what materials can uh, these things be made out of? And I have them up here. You can come up and look afterwards because of COVID, we're not gonna pass them around. Um, you know, the easiest ones on very small bodies of water is monofilament line. We started out with that, I don't know, around the mid-90s. Monofilament line is cheap, crosses the basin easy. It, uh, it sags a lot because it stretches. So that's one option. It's usually the cheapest and it's going to last a year to maybe two years. It breaks because of UV light and cold weather and so forth. The next step up, a little bit more durable, is this braided fishing line. This is just one company's, you know, this is a 150 pound test braided line. We like the high visible stuff, it helps birds see it. That stuff comes up into 250 pound, you can get it in salt water. We usually try to get the heavier stuff in salt water line. It's very durable and visible. It doesn't sag as much, um, so it's a tool that on the cheap ones and the small ones would be the, the one that we go to first really and recommend first. Um, a couple of decades ago people used polypropylene wires. They were about this big, um, plastic derivative. I don't see that anymore. It's kind of expensive. It didn't stretch but it only lasted a few years in UV light. But you may read about polypropylene lines. Stainless steel wires. Early on, three decades ago, that's what we saw people put up. Very thin, you know, like a pencil width, stainless steel wires across the pond. Problem is that stuff's brittle. I mean, it lasts forever, it's stainless steel, right? It doesn't sag much because it's stainless steel. You can get it nice and tight. But it is thin, it doesn't have much give, so potentially, I guess it could hurt birds if they hit it. Um, but because it breaks when things hit it, people quit using it. And it's kind of expensive, steel's not cheap now. Um, the last product that I'm aware of and the, the option to select for using is overhead wires is Kevlar. The bottom is a picture of a big spool. We buy big spools, 15,000 foot at a time. This wire here, it's, so it's very durable. The same stuff they make bulletproof vests out of. Um, it has UV uh, retardants in it, so it doesn't degrade. The stuff will last 10 years. Uh, it's probably the most expensive type of overhead barrier wire we can put in, but again, it lasts a long time. 
The other challenge with it is it takes some special parts. You have to get little thimbles, and I'll show you some pictures of that, and then sleeves to crimp it so that you're not damaging the, the wire itself so it doesn't break through time. Um, <clears throat> So when we work with someone on installing these, they, we can teach them how to install them. We install them for people. Um, we really look at the size of the basin, what's the most economical wire to use, and then how do we design this thing? And so the length and the width are extremely important. If you have a very narrow body of water and our span of wire is only gonna go 15 yards across it, and it could be a mile long, that's fine but the span that the wire crosses is narrow, these things work a lot better because wire through time, monofilament, polypropylene, Kevlar, will sag. You put these things up, you got a long span, 200 yard span over this corporate pond in Bloomington, let's say. The next day that wire's in the water because the whole thing stretched. So you gotta tighten it up. Two days later, you tighten it up. Monofilament, you tighten that every week for two months. Kevlar doesn't stretch much. Usually about one week into it, you tighten it and that stuff's set. So that's a lot less labor in the long term. But the design of how we run it so that we don't have a long span to cover reduces the sag. If you have a, a line 20 yards, it's not gonna drop as much as a line that's 200. The dropping is important because if your lines in the middle of the pond end up in the water, they're not going to deter geese from flying in, and they're not going to deter, deter geese from swimming. You need that line about 12 to 18 inches above the water. They do not like to land when there's barriers in the way because they have a long approach, and when they take off, they have a long departure path, just like a plane. So these wires at 20 feet are excellent deterrents to keep geese from using a barrier. So here's one of our designs, and, and we generally don't put in a grid. Started out three decades ago, we did grids, but then we learned, why not save money and time? We'll just span the short one up and down here, every 20 feet. And if in three weeks the birds are still using it, about the same number of them dang things, which is almost never happens, we'll go then drop in these horizontals and make a grid, and that almost always will stop it. And that's rare that we have to do that grid. Um, but it can happen where there's a very high number of geese, that's when we might have to look at even a perimeter fence around the edge. Very costly, but it depends on how much you want to invest to solve your problem. These things do work. Uh, the other thing we have to look at before we even, I probably should have this slide in the beginning, is does the water level fluctuate? If your water level fluctuates significantly in your basin, this is not the tool for you because one day your wires are 18 inches over the water. Four weeks later when it's been dry, the water's dropped 12 feet and now your wires are way above the water and the geese can come in under it. And we have places that the water rises quickly and it goes up over the wires and they're underwater. It's a heyday for the geese until the water goes down and then they're covered in all kinds of debris and everything else and they're sagging and breaking. You need stable water. So most homeowners association basins and parks have pretty stable water within a couple feet and that's perfect for this type of system. I wouldn't put it in a basin like this. So how do we anchor this stuff? So on the monofilament and even, let's say, the, the height, the, the braided line, on the top left there, you can just put it on a rebar post, cheap rebar. Put it in the water if you mow up to the edge. Now when ice comes, that can be a problem. We deal with that differently. You can put it at the edge of the water. They have to mow around it. Um, rebar can be considered a, a safety hazard or liability, so we put a little cap on there, the same kinds of construction folks use, tape it on so the kids don't pull them off and throw at each other. Um, but pretty inexpensive system for small basins, especially if they're short-term need. Um, the next step up, you know, we look at on the right, you can see those T-posts. That system is gonna be used for a heavier type of line like this Kevlar. Um, and then the cap on it again, we use construction glue, make sure they're, they're on there well, so we don't have anybody getting hurt. And then other designs at other places, you can see in the bottom here, these PVC posts. So there's a number of different ways that we anchor it depending on the wire itself. 
So we have a post, whatever we decided, and how are we going to anchor it? So here's that Kevlar. You can see that a little thimble provides a nice loop for that wire to go through the anchoring eye hook there. And that little thimble is this little thing here. You can come up and look at it. Hooks right to the eye hook, just like this. When we're using Kevlar, again, which is our most common. Then we go to the other side of the pond. Well, how do we get that wire tight? And how do we maintain its tension? So we use a device called an inline strainer, just like this. Pretty cheap, get them at the farm store. Can't name any farm stores, but you probably know of a few. And that allows us to have a special tool to, to spin that spool and it tightens the line. So we'll put that Kevlar in, we'll get it tight, very taut, and then we'll come back in one week and retighten it because it'll sag, it'll stretch with time, usually that one, one time. Most of the time it's just once. Um, the other thing that we try to do on these bigger spans, as you can see on this one here, we pre-rolled this. We took everything off the spool. Every 30 yards we tied a flag so that when it's out over the basin as we're spooling it out, there's a little flag on there. So the geese can see that the first few weeks and they can help them visualize that deterrent. And you can see maybe it doesn't show up. Here there's a flag, here there's a flag. There's like it's all coming off that spool as we spool it out just to help the birds see it. Now recognize that we've heard people complain about, oh, you know, the geese are getting killed, the gulls are hitting it, hanging up. I hear that a lot. But to be honest, I've been doing this 30 years this spring. I can remember one time I actually really think a bird, a goose hit a wire and was injured. One time. So it's a possibility and we try to minimize the chances. But I don't think the facts really support the contention that this is a, a tool that we need to avoid for humaneness. It, it's just, it, it's not a big problem. And so here you can see maybe these a little bit better. These are Mylar streamers. Um, where did I have that Mylar? I, I don't even remember if I showed it before. I showed that flash tape at one point. We'll hang a, a it's a flashes, blows in the wind, catches light. We'll hang that on there. That's something that people put along their ponds sometimes too for temporary dispersal. So we'll hang those on there. Um, the systems in almost every case are effective. We've had park districts that want to use their lakes just, let's say, for ice skating. So they'll have us put them up in the spring and they'll be there spring, summer, and fall and then tear them down. And so we use the cheaper stuff, right? We're gonna use an economical system. Other park districts want people to paddle boat and fish. And so we don't put anything up, but they have such a goose problem. They say, October, our uses are stopping. Put up the wires before the migrants join these residents. And so we put them up in the fall and they'll stay till ice on and they can tear them down. Cheap systems, re rot and, and reuse that material. So there's a, you can be very creative, can work in a lot of places. If you have a severe problem, I'd encourage you to at least consider it. And you can certainly call Craig or Brad or myself. You have our number there. It'll be on the link, I think, uh, or on, on the YouTube tape of this. And we talk you through it and help you out and help you build it. If you want to build it yourself, we'll do everything we can to make it successful. So as we learned, learned tonight that uh, these open areas, these recreational areas, these green spaces that we all love to have in our, our communities are an excellent attractant for Canada geese. Uh, they provide great food, so for, food source for them. There's less predators for them. And often in these urban areas, you know, they can get all their, their requirements that they need to, to live out their life and they're protected from um, hunting and other activities that might uh, remove some individuals. Um, and, uh, and outside of the nesting season, it's really not the, the presence of the geese that's the main conflict. It's, it's the, what they leave behind. It's the droppings that we see there. And it can be you know, on athletic fields, cemeteries, uh, just uh, picnic areas and and that's really the issue that we're trying to solve here with the chemical re repellents um, something that we can put on the, 
put on the grass that stops foraging so that they're not um, leaving their droppings behind as they're, as they're eating. So there's more and more products coming out on the market um, all the time and, and we don't have the resources to go through and test the viability of these products. Uh, it's important to do homework before you just spend a lot of money on it. Read the, care read the label carefully. Some of these are going to be just where individuals can apply it, you know, whether it's their home, the public area, or wherever. Other, other chemicals are going to be registered to where, you know, you can only apply it to your own home. And if you apply it in public areas or you're charging for it, you're going to need to get a license through the Illinois Depart Department of Public Health. So, um, as Scott kind of mentioned, um, the main chemical that we've found success with is the um, the one clear on the right, the one that kind of produces an intestinal uh, irritation. There's uh, the methyl and threnaline that he talked briefly about. There's a, there's a lot of companies out there pr producing that. Um, and like Scott said, you kind of get a limited success out of that in open areas for, for geese in this, in this area. So we recommend, or we use in situations more that anthraquinone based one, that's their active ingredient. Uh, it, it doesn't have a, an odor or a taste aversion. It, you, it, the geese will eat that grass, but as soon as they consume it, they're gonna have an intestinal distress. And then in addition to that, there's a UV uh, marker on it. So UV spectrum is what the geese are are seeing it so they can visually see that that grass is treated versus untreated grass. So the combination of, you know, irritation and this visual cue, it helps te teach, the, teach the geese or push them to areas that are not treated because they will eventually over time learn that that, that grass there is, is bad. I want to come over here and eat this grass over on this side. So, I mean, most of the products are something that you're going to put spray on. There was the one granule that you can get on a five-gallon bucket, but we're really talking about, at this point, flight control, which is the anthracrotone-based spray here. And it really just depends on what kind of equipment you need and the size of the area that you're going to treat. If you're going to treat your backyard, you know, the pump sprayer probably can do it if you're just tr treating a, a band around your, your business or if you're just trying to treat this front front entryway of, this, of the extension office here, you know, a pump sprayer might be all you need. But if you're gonna treat a park, yeah, you're gonna want a boom sprayer that's either pulled behind a, a lawn tractor or a UTV. You can get equipment to put it in the back of a truck if you're willing to drive through, you know, turf area and run it up. Uh, but what, once you determine that equipment, the, the chemical itself can be applied any time that the ambient temperature is above freezing. So, you know, it's not just uh, while the grass is growing, it can be while the grass is dormant, the, the geese will still use it in that early season and in that late season. But typically we're, you know, we're doing it while the grass is growing in that growing season. So uh, one thing with this chemical is your application, the timing of how many times you're gonna apply it is really dependent on how many times you're going to mow it because you're going to treat the grass after you mow it. The grass is, let's say, four inches tall. Two weeks, or you know, a week later, it's it's time to cut it. So you're cutting probably a couple inches off. Now you only got two two inches of chemical on that treated grass. Not, another week goes by, you probably cut all the at least 90% of the chemical off the grass. So now you basically have untreated grass, and the geese know it, so they're starting to come back in. So it's time to spray again. So things you can do, you know, obviously you, know, you don't need to keep the grass at four inches. You might not be able to, need to keep the grass at four inches. If it's turf field, if it's athletic field, you probably are gonna be restricted to get, keep the grass short. But you know, in some of these picnic areas, you could let the grass grow a little bit longer, kind of space out your treatments. It is expensive. Uh, you're putting out a gallon of the product per acre, so our best guess probably is about $250 per acre. You multiply that by, you know, whether you're doing it 
six, seven, eight times a year, it, it gets expensive. Uh, that's why we don't advocate that you're going to do this to a whole big park. It's really trying to determine, you know, what is your sensitive areas? Where, where can you not tolerate very much goose droppings? And if this is occurring, you've got other food sources. You know, maybe they don't need to even eat grass. Maybe they're not even consuming a whole lot of grass uh, throughout a month or several sort of week window where people are feeding them. Or there's there's mulberry tree and there's there's plenty of mulberries underneath that tr tree for several weeks. Um, the weed seeds that can sprout up, you know, you treated the grass, but in, the, in between your treatment, weed seeds came, or weeds came up, went to seed, the geese are eating the seeds, they're not even bothering the, the grass, so all this comes into play. And, and one thing a lot of people don't realize is, you know, that if they're just using your, your park for shelter, for shade, for during the heat of the day, they're still gonna come in and use that shade. Um, and they're going to leave some droppings behind as they come in and, and rest and then when they go to leave. So you got you to survey your area and make sure that stopping foraging is really going to solve your, help solve your problem. And, and obviously you can stop uh, people from giving out handouts and that would really help your program as well. Um, but yeah, kind of going back more to determine what areas we should, what areas, what areas we should treat, and what areas we, you know, kind of leave for the geese to, to, to forage in, because the, the repellent alone is you're not gonna, you're not gonna spray your way out of the problem. Uh, you can apply it to the park and. And it's not going to, without harassment, without other tools, you're probably always going to have geese there. Um, but in a limited capacity, you can kind of push those geese to areas that you have a higher tolerance for geese in that area. So in this picture, obviously on the soccer fields, that would be an excellent place to put the, the product. You can kind of push those geese off that field so that the kids can play soccer and not come back green with manure, um, just be green grass stains. And then, you know, that, that machine right there is really just designed to wash the, the path there, um, primarily, primarily probably to wash the, the goose droppings off, off the path. So the path to them is, to this park is important enough to rig up a sprayer machine like that. So you can put, you can put a band on either side of that path, and it's going to kind of, again, push those geese further away from that path, so that you're going to have less droppings on that on that path. I mean, spraying the path is not going to do any good. It's not labeled for that, but they're not consuming anything in that pavement, so it's it's not going to do any what any good. But you can kind of push those geese off into the corners of your park. And this is just an overview of a random park in Central Illinois, really just something I found off Google Earth that was good for this demonstration. So, you know, you have a park like this and it's, it's, it's large. Um, you've got a lot of public use areas. You've got, you know, picnic t pavilions, which I'm assuming there's picnic tables underneath. You've got a splash park or some sort of pool area. You've got tennis courts, you've got baseball fields. But you also have a lot of green space in there that, that looks to be, you know, just there for, maybe future development or just open space just for aesthetics. So with that, you know, you can kind of focus into your key areas where there's high human traffic and just kind of treat those areas and, and push them into um, less to use areas. But the situation that we have more often than not is, is more de depicted in this picture where we've got residential houses, you know, right up to the, to the basically to the shore of the the pond. I mean, there's probably a common way around there. There's a nice path all the way around. And what you guys are seeing is that there's a path that's basically unusable because of the amount of goose droppings on there. Um, so 
So what do you do in that situation? I mean, spraying that common area is likely going to deter foraging in that area, but what you're doing is pushing them up, up into people's homes. You know, maybe we find that that's okay, but more than likely, no, people are not going to want them on the manure that's in the backyard. So that's where we get in a situation where, you know, the repellent can help, but you're also going to need to harass those geese off that, that, that area or do other tools to keep the geese just completely off that, that pond. You just, like I said, you can't always just spray your way out of a problem. You're going to have to implement other tools uh, in order to achieve your goal of, of being able to use your common area. And this is, I threw this picture on there just because I was doing, you know, just looking through there and have some of the other, really just turf management, goose, goose mat, managing turf to reduce the amount of, of goose use. Um, this is, it's just a lawn sweeper that someone has designed to sweep up manu goose manure. So I don't know how well it works. I'm assuming the grass has to be maintained short. It would have to be thick in order for the sweeping operate, uh, sweeper to actually kick it up. Obviously, you know, if it's fresh, it's messy, but you know, it's just, it's really just a depiction of someone just thinking outside of the box, hey, you know, we kind of thrown off our hands, let's, let's try this route. And, and that's, that's wildlife damage management in a nutshell is, you know, probably in five, 10 years, we're gonna be up here telling you a new, a new technique to use, new chemical, new something, because we're always trying to attack the problem from a different angle. Uh, and we have to, because they get used to the tools that we throw at them, and we just have to adapt and overcome. It's good that we're going to take a few minutes to talk about egg oil. It's a, it's, it's really a, a, a good way and uh, to curb production. Um, we've got geese on the landscape. We've determined that they're overabundant, and we're trying to uh, stop that from, stop that problem from getting any worse. Or maybe we're at the the level that we want to be, and we just want to maintain that level. So. You know what? What's the most logical thing is to curb the curb the production, and through egg oiling, it, it can be very effective if you, if you're good at, at finding nests and and treat those nests. Um, to get to 100 percent, that's not realistic, uh, but you can you can slow the curve, and that's that's really helpful uh, in, in managing your problems. So as, as Scott was talking about it, you're you're going to be treating these 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 eggs with with vegetable oil. Corn oil is is what's labeled for for, for use through the EPA, and uh, you're stopping the embryo development. That's how you're curbing the production. Uh, you still need to be employing some of the other tools that are out there. You know, uh, maintain or. Habitat modification in order to reduce that attractiveness to your area, increase, continue to do harassment to keep them off your, your site, especially prior to nest building. You know, if you can kind of push them into an area that is, is more of a natural area or an area that has a higher tolerance for geese, then, you know, you've, you've kind of helped to solve your problem. And, but before we begin to oil uh, goose, goose nests or goose eggs, we're going to have to contact uh, Ben Williams with the Illinois Department of Natural Resources and, and get a permit from him. Um, these are federally protected animals, so you need a, a permit in order to manage the, manage the, the eggs. So it, the, the permit is free. You just need to contact Ben, describe your situation and at the end you're going to need to collect some information or record your data so you can report back to Ben just how many um, nests and eggs that you you've managed and if you have any more questions about 
the permit. Ben's going to be around. Uh, we flashed his, his contact information up there several times. If you don't feel like coming up to him, talk to him. You can get him on the phone. So it, here we are. It's September now, almost October. So it's a little early to start thinking about goose nest. But here, come February, you guys, if you're doing it for HOA, you should have it up in your mind and thinking, okay, this spring we need to start searching for uh, nesty, nesting geese on my site, not in February, but just have a plan like, okay, who's going to do it? How often are we going to be searching? Um, what happens if the guy goes off and goes to Florida that's supposed to be searching for a nest? So have some backup plans. Uh, because they're, they're going to march for the geese are going to march forward and, and try to nest regardless if you're watching them or not. So in our area, you're looking at mid-March uh, to through April into May, kind of depending on you, you'll see a little bit of nesting in late March. It really starts ramping up about mid-April. What is the typical turnaround time from the time of application until we get something back? And how long is this uh, permit valid for? Does it have to be renewed every year or does it have to be? Why don't we, uh, we'll answer that. I'll make a note and we'll get that soon. Okay, yeah. So here we are ramping up in, in mid-April. And you also have natural predation going on. So if they start to make a nest and a raccoon comes and has an egg omelet, they're starting to clock all over again. So that's why you know it's not uncommon to see geese still nesting clear in, into mid-May or even you know late May if they're they're pushing it. But really you know, by, by uh, Memorial Day, you're pretty much done with, with goose goose nesting as of now, you know. Hopefully they don't decide to change and figure out a way to make more than one brood a year. And as we talked about before, you know, islands in a, on a lake, excellent place because anything that needs to come out there and predate them is, is going to have to swim that water in order to get to them. So you just... Just by that alone, you get less predation. They do nest, you know, in, a, like I said, undisturbed areas. So you should be searching in people's uh, landscaping. That's a great area. You've got mulch, you've got landscaping. I get into that. But uh, what you're looking for is nice little round nests built out of just the vegetation around. It's dried vegetation. Usually, it's usually. A grass or a grass type, and you'll see the feathers, and that's that's one thing that you can kind of see from a distance. Is it just a all that down feathers float, floating in the wind or kind of shimmering in the wind? So once you found the nest, you're going to want to try to determine what stage are they at. Are they are they still laying? Are they incubating? And then what what stage of incubation are are they at? Because and the way to determine first, I'll just go through, determine whether they're incubated or not. So if they're still laying, you know, you can pick up the, the egg. And Scott's got an egg there. So it's a, it's a big size egg. You'll, you'll notice it's a, a lot bigger than your normal chicken egg. It's bigger than a duck egg. It's, it's a large egg, so you know it's a goose. You feel it, and if it's cold to the touch or you know air temperature, they're still laying. Once, once they start incubating, those those um, eggs are going to feel warm to the touch. And then to determine where, what stage they are in incubation, you're going to put it in a bucket of water and see if it sinks to the bottom or floats to the top. So if it sinks to the bottom, you know, it's somewhere between zero to, you know, halfway through incubation, they incubate for, for 28 days. Um, and that's the stage that you'd want to be treating the eggs with oil. Um, anything above that, you really just resort to picking them up, collecting them, and putting them in a the sanitary um, landfill. Just put them in your normal trash. It's beyond the point to where you can stop that embryo development, and the most humane way is just to, re to remove the eggs themselves. 
So the, egg, the, the, the eggs are at the, age, the stage of, of treatment. You're going to wipe the water off, and you're going to treat it with corn oil. And you're going to treat it with enough corn oil that it kind of coats that outside ed, edge. They tell you it's about you know one teaspoon of, of oil, but when you're squirting it on with your your pump your hand pump sprayer, you'll you'll start spritzing it, and then you'll see a coating, and then all of a sudden it just kind of coats and covers it. And that corn oil is you know stopping the gas exchange, and that's what kind of terminates that embryo. So uh, they found that you know corn oil is a real effective way of using it. It's 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 environmental friendly. It's easily obtainable from a grocery store. So you know it's it's a good way to it, it's a good product to use. So the one thing that we don't or we haven't told you about yet is okay. You got a goose on a nest. How am I going to oil that egg? Because the goose is on the nest. And then he's, just, he's got a mate, and they don't like the idea of me just coming up there and oiling the egg. So, oftentimes, you know, the naive ones, the first time they do it, they just get up and they kind of walk away. As long as you approach them in a matter of being very determined, and you're going to come and look at their nest. But the ones that have been around, have been around for a while, and they've oiled their nest a few times. They get aggressive, and they they do what. You know their job is to is to protect their protect their young. So they're going to get aggressive towards you. You see in the upper upper right there, he's using an umbrella to make himself look bigger. So that's one thing you can do. Just you know, whether it's an umbrella, whether it's a trash can, a five gallon bucket, a piece of heavy duty cardboard, or maybe smash together a couple cardboards, but something to kind of block you from the goose. Um, I've held a, goose, a bucket up and the goose is getting mad at that bucket while I'm squirting the eggs. A lot, it, you know, the real aggressive one, it's nice to have two people there so that one person can be doing the work and one person can kind of, you know, keep in the, keep in the goose back because, you know, they'll sneak up behind you and bite you if you're not careful, so. So that's, I mean, that's, that's the biggest challenge. That's the biggest reason why people don't want to do it themselves, um, is, is the fact that the geese, it, they hurt when they hit you with their wings. So, you know, it's, it's, as long as you know it going into it, you know, it's, it's manageable, but it's something to, to think about if you really want to. Uh, another thing to, that we didn't, I didn't mention yet, um, is that you find the nest, you know, and they and they were they weren't incubating yet. You really don't need to. You can go and move on to the next nest. You really don't have to oil that that egg that that, that nest yet until it starts getting to the incubation stage. There's nothing wrong with oiling it early. It's just you know it just depends on whether or not you want to expend your time onto that because you know you're going to have to come back because they're going to lay more eggs. So you're gonna, you know you're going to have to come back. So, and then we usually will oil once they get incubating, oil it twice. Um, and it's good to to continually check throughout that that egg laying scene all the way through through May because again, a raccoon can come in, remove the eggs, for, you know, eat those eggs, and then she starts starts the clock. With this egg oiling, what you're trying to do is is to get that, you're tricking the, the goose because she thinks that the eggs are still viable when, after you oil them, they're, they're still there. And what they've kind of evolved with is a predator coming in and eating the eggs and then they know, hey, I gotta lay more eggs. But the eggs are there and they're, they just feel that they can just continue to incubate those eggs and they're gonna hatch. Um, So as long as you get her to a stage where she can't physically produce any more eggs, that's what you're trying to do with, with oiling and, and keeping those eggs in the, in, treated and unviable. And then once she reaches a the stage, then she physically can't.
producing more eggs, and you've got it through the nesting season. When you find these, these nests, you know, the vegetation is going to continue to grow through the spring, so sometimes it's nice to be able to, to put a marker out so that you can easily identify where the, the nest is later on after the cattails grow up or the grass grows up or, or whatever. Um, and then on this picture is, is one of our data sheets just collecting the information that Ben wants. Is, you know, and, and it kind of organizes it and, and keeps it so that you know also where to look in the future because they typically nest in the same area year after year after year. Uh, you may get them to move in a slight direction one way or another after several years because they try to find new areas to produce. Because over time, they, it's almost like they realize, hey, I'm not producing any young, so I need to move my nest in order to produce young. So that's why they move to rooftops or further away from ponds. Uh, but you know, it's, it's generally in the same, same area. But what, what Ben needs is the number of eggs that are treated, the number of, and the, how many nests you treated eggs in. That's a good way of saying it. And you, you're treating your HOA, or your, your pond, your, your area. And we all know that these, these ponds are interconnected or it might only be a short walk from one pond to another. So your neighbors may not be treating. So they may go and produce some goslings and then over time wander to your pond because for some reason and they, they like it better. So that's where you get to the point. That's where 100% that's where reduction is, or 100% stopping of production is not realistic because you've got outside individuals coming in. And maybe it's just the fact that, you know, it's, it's found an area that is close enough to your pond that it, it can produce and no one's bothering it. You know, maybe it's not even in another neighborhood. It's, it's far enough upstream or down the grass way that no one even knows it's nesting over there and it's, you're the closest water body. I don't know how far they will walk to water, but I know duck, duckling, you know, it's, it's not unheard of that a duckling will walk a mile to water. So start, you know, it wouldn't be unrealistic for a gosling to walk, up, you know, a mile. And it's, as soon as they hatch and they dry up, they're moving, they're walking towards water, whatever direction that is. And that pretty much wraps up this slide. Um, do you want to recommend the body? Yeah. Where they can find providers and liability? Yeah, so if, if any of these, you know, whether it's egg oil, put, uh, applying chemical, doing harassment, any of that, uh, if, the, if that's something that you decide you want to do, one, one really good website to go to is, is um, U of I's website. It's, it's li uh, Wildlife Illinois Living with Wildlife is what, what what the website is. I don't know if there's brochures out there or not. There are, there are some. Wildlife.illinois.org. Yeah. Wildlife.illinois.org. Wildlife wildlife we'll get you there. And what you're going to find in there is, is a list of service providers uh, that can provide you, you know, whether it's egg oil and chemical uh, repellents, um, dogs any of it. And, and what we also recommend is, is look into that, that company and make sure that they have li uh, liability insurance so that it, it wouldn't be unheard of that they come onto your property and the dogs attack someone or they, the workers trip and fall, whatever. It's, it's 2021 and you know people get sued all the time. And in, in addition to that, you know, we're here, we will provide free technical assistance. We also provide some of these same, you know, whether it's egg oil and chemical uh, repellents or harassment. And one thing we don't deal with is, is canine harassment. We don't have people that have dogs. So look elsewhere for the, if you want that service.